today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom, and I'm joined today by my myeloma friends, including Pat Killingsworth, Gary Peterson, Jack Aiello, and Cynthia Jimlowskis, co-hosts. We would like to thank today's episode sponsor, Takeda Oncology, for their support of Myeloma Crowd Radio and Myeloma Patients. This is the ninth in a very important series featuring the Myeloma Crowd Research Initiative, This is proof that patients can help to find and fund curative research for myeloma. This has been an amazing journey so far. We have created an expert scientific advisory board, then invited active patient advocates to join together for the project. Together, we decided to go after solutions for high-risk myeloma because these patients have dismal outcomes, even with the great advances that have been made in the disease. We also believe that by addressing high risk, new discoveries will ultimately help all patients because we all become high risk at some point in our journey. We called for letters of intent and received back 36 high quality proposals from top investigators around the world. Our scientific advisory board then scored these proposals and selected a top 10. This show is number nine in in the 10 that we will complete. After the shows are finished and full proposals have been submitted, both the scientific advisory board and the patient advisory board will vote to select a small number of proposals to fund. Now, to all of our listeners and readers, today is the day that you can join with us to find a cure for this disease that threatens our lives. As Gary said in a video that we prepared, this is our chance to save ourselves. So today, you can now help by creating your own fundraising page. In a web browser, you should go to http colon two forward slashes mcri.mylomacrowd.org. So notice that there's no www. And click on Build a Team. You can upload your own photo and write your own text to customize your page. We won't um, have you share that page with friends and family just yet because we want to first know which projects are will be selected. But this is an easy first step you can take, and we are going to need your help. Now, today we are very privileged to have with us Dr. Hermann Einzela and Dr. Michael Hudecek from the University of Würzburg in Germany. Welcome, doctors. Hello. Welcome. Hello. It's nice to be on the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let me introduce you both. Dr. Hermann Einzler is Professor of Internal Medicine and Director of the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Würzburg. Following his medical training at the Universities of Tumigen, Manchester, London, and Seattle, he became a research fellow in the Department of Hematology, Oncology, Rheumatology, Immunology at the University of Tumigen. Tübingen, Germany. I told you, Dr. Einzler. <laughs> Professor that was Einzler perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. Is a member of the American Society of Hematology, the European Group for Blood and Marrow Transplantation, and the EBMT Working Parties for Infectious Disease and Immunobiology. He is currently a member of the Board of German Society of the Blood and Marrow Stem Cell Transplantation. In 1999, he became chairman of the German Study Group in multiple myeloma. In 2003, he received the Van Beckham Award of the European Society of Blood and Marrow Transplantation. He has published more than 350 articles in peer-reviewed journals. His research interests include multiple myeloma, stem cell transplantation, and adoptive immunotherapy. He's a member of the board of the German Lymphoma Group. In April 2011, he was elected Honorary Fellowship of the Royal College of Pathologists in the UK. Dr. Michael Hudecek is clinical fellow and research group leader for the CAR T-cell lab work at the University of Würzburg. Dr. Hudecek obtained his medical degree with summa cum laude from University of Leipzig, Germany, and performed his postdoctoral research fellowship at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Dr. Hudecek joined the University of Würzburg in 2012 as a clinical fellow and research group leader. His awards include an LLS Fellowship Award, German Cancer Help Award for the Max Eder Excellence Program for his T-cell engineering work, and the Young Scholar Award for the Bavarian Academy of Science. So, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Maybe you can give us just an overview of your history in immunotherapy, how this all came about, and specifically in how it relates to your work in CAR T-cells. Yeah, here's Herman Einzel who's speaking. Maybe I start first of all. So first of all, thanks very much for uh, letting us uh, present our proposal here and explaining our strategy to deal with myeloma, uh, including especially immunotherapeutic strategies. 
Now, uh, apart from multiple myeloma, and we really have a large program here in Würzburg, we see about more than 500 patients with myeloma per year, and we have different clinical trials open. We have quite a bit of research ongoing in the field of myeloma. So the, this, my second industry is really immunotherapy, and uh, I was one of the first that really used T cells to treat infections in patients with hematological malignancies. And we later on developed strategies to redirect T cells. So we took T cells uh, that were, for example, specific for influenza virus or a cytomegalovirus, and by using a new antibody constructs, we forced these T cells to actually attack tumor cells. And that was a strategy which is kind of a precursor of the CAR T-cell program. And we started this already in the early 2000s. And because we, we actually developed this strategy, um, I think we are very well prepared to, to use CAR T-cells in the clinic because this strategy of bispecific antibodies has a similar approach to redirect T cells, to attack the tumor cell, and also to learn about the side effects of this strategy. So we have seen the typical side effects of T cell therapy already when we use the biospecifics and, and develop strategies to really get around this. So this is, is my kind of history of immunotherapy, and I just hand over to Michael Hudicek, who really is the expert in at least in our clinic for CAR T cell therapy. Okay, so this is Michael speaking. So how how did I get into into the the CAR T cell work? And um this journey for me started when I was at medical school and this is maybe now like 8 uh, years ago when I was a medical student I got interested in in hematology and I learned during medical training how bone marrow transplantation was successfully used um to treat patients with with advanced leukemias and lymphomas. And that, and I understood that essentially um, um, the curative mechanism of how bone marrow transplantation works is is uh, driven by T cells that derive from the donor, from the, the marrow donor, and that learn to recognize um, antigens, so molecules that are expressed on the leukemia or lymphoma cells, and uh, that this uh, graft versus leukemia effect driven by T cells was so strong that it could cure. Uh, a very aggressive leukemia and lymphomas. And that was so impressive to me that I decided uh, to pursue this scientifically in the lab. And I got the, the chance to then uh, go to Seattle to the Threat Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, the, the center that developed bone marrow transplantation, and to advance my knowledge in, in, in science and how to do good science as a medical doctor. And um, so, you know, I tried to, to, to isolate uh, leukemia reactive uh, T cells. T cells that can can recognize leukemic cells and destroy them from you know panels of patients that had undergone bone marrow transplantation. And what I saw is that in each of these patients, the the molecules that these T cells recognized on the leukemia were different. So it was hard uh, to to develop out of that uh, novel therapies um, that would be consistent and unique, or consistent in the same, or kind of be able to share it between larger cohorts of patients. And this is how we got into this uh, this uh, car work because uh, the car receptor this is like a sensor that you then introduce into your T cell and of course you can determine the specificity of this receptor of this sensor and say okay if we have a molecule that is expressed uh, uniformly um between on leukemic cells or on myeloma cells um and ideally a molecule that is shared between um myeloma cells derived from different patients, then this would be a very elegant way of treating a myeloma or leukemia with T cells. And so I started uh, to get interested in the, these CAR receptors and actually started work in, in, in uh, the lab in Seattle. That is uh, Dr. Stan Rudell and Philip Greenberg. They are also pioneers in this immunology, in this immunotherapy field. And I constructed uh, started constructing and then playing around with these car receptors. And we've you know, learned many things about how to design these receptors because they are essentially synthetic molecules. These car receptors do not exist um, in nature. So they are assembled of um, you know, amino acids and it's an entirely synthetic modular receptor. So you um, take a targeting uh, domain 
um, put it on a spacer and transmembrane a domain, that's how we call it, to put it on the surface of a T-cell. And then you add to it a little signaling module that can activate the T-cell once it sees its antigen. And there's a lot of freedom how to engineer these receptors. And we learned uh, some of the rules that are important so that this receptor works well. And I had the privilege to, to design some of these receptors that are now actually in clinical uh, application and clinical use. So one of these receptors is targeting the CD19 molecule. That's a molecule expressed on um, uh, leukemias and lymphomas, and that is in a clinical trial where more than 40 patients have been treated um, as of to date, and more than 90% of these patients are in a complete remission. So mm -hmm. this is how I also saw kind of firsthand how powerful this immune strategy can be. And um, now we've extended this work uh, to target other molecules. One of them is called ROR1. That's a molecule also expressed in solid tumors. And when I um, then joined the team here of Professor Einzele in Würzburg, I also, of course, got interested in can we make a car receptor that can work for multiple myeloma? And um, you know, we've, we've uh, written about uh, some of the, this work uh, in, in our proposal. The CS1 molecule is, is, in our view, one of the, the hottest uh, or best suited target molecules, and we've constructed CS1-specific cars that work really, really well in our preclinical models. So this is how I got into this car work, and um, you know, it's really a pleasure to be in this field because it, is, um, it has so much potential in, in treating very advanced malignant diseases, so it's, it's very exciting to be part of that. Well, perfect. Thank you for giving us that background. And maybe we have, we have done one show on CAR T-cells, so we have learned a little bit about that, but for those who have not listened to that before, could you give us just a short overview of how CAR T-cells work in general? Of course, absolutely. So, um, as I said, the, the CAR receptor that stands for chimeric antigen receptor, it's a, it's a synthetic uh, receptor. It works like a sensor, so it allows a cell that expresses this uh, sensor to recognize um, a target molecule, we call it an antigen, on, on, on target cells. And if that antigen is being recognized, then the T cells get to work. And you know, T cells have uh, several ways of how they work. They uh, can lyse and destroy uh, the target cells. It's called uh, cytotoxicity. Um, they have other effective functions, so they produce cytokines. Um, so this is kind of so all little molecules that the T cells use to communicate with each other and kind of say, look, there's something going on here, and we have to work together on eradicating whatever that target is. And the T cells proliferate, and they proliferate until they've reached sufficient numbers so they can uh, very efficiently combat, um, in our case, uh, the tumor. And all this is triggered by, by the CAR receptor. Now, the question is, why do we need a CAR receptor um, to do that? And um, the, the, the answer to that is that there's a fundamental principle in, in yeah. immunology, and, uh, and this is, uh, that the immune system has learned to distinguish self from non-self. So the immune system will tip not, not attack uh, the normal body. So it is what we call tolerant to self. But as soon as it sees uh, you know, an intruder, a pathogen, typically a virus, it will start uh, to get to work and eliminate it. The problem with tumors like myeloma is that uh, the immune system is kind of torn. It, it doesn't really know, shall we attack this or shall we not, because uh, the, 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 the tumor or the malignant cells are deriving from normal cells in, in the body. Still, we, we clearly think these myeloma cells, these malignant cells do not belong there and they should be attacked. So with the CAR receptor, we, we kind of help the immune system out a little bit. So we introduce this receptor and say, look, the myeloma has to be attacked, and this is what the CAR does. Maybe just a, a few words on, on, on how what the, the car receptor then, then looks like. Um, it, it's a chimera because it, it, it binds to a surface molecule like an antibody. But then it is coupled, of course, to the killing machinery of the T cells. So the immune response is, uh, again, is still you know, is a lot stronger. Um, the T cells can uh, divide and amplify in the body. So it's like a living drug that we generate. And they can also form memory then that's very, a very particular feature about these T cells. So it's not only that we give these T cells to a patient and they get to work against the, the myeloma or the tumor, um, they can also form memory 
and pr protect the patient from a relapse. And this is why we're so excited about this strategy because it's, uh, it might be possible that with a single infusion of these CAR T cells, you can not only eradicate the tumor, but uh, you can also protect the patient from a relapse. And that's, what, that's why you know, the CAR is needed, because it mediates that recognition of malignant cells, and in our case, myeloma cells. Okay, Did that that's kind of a, answer your question? Oh, yes, that's, uh, that's a great um, explanation for a very basic question, and you gave a great answer, so thank you. Um, thank you. So we were asking in the other show why the CS1 target. Maybe you want to address that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... As I said, the, the immune system, you know, using immune-based therapies, uh, these are very potent therapies. So um, selecting the, the, the right um, target molecule is an essential part in this process. So you want to you wanna, uh, choose a target molecule that is, you know, ideally only expressed on the malignant cells, on myeloma, but not on any healthy tissues, because that, you know, otherwise you would see a lot of side effects, which we don't want. So in, in, in every cancer, and also here in myeloma, we've been looking for target molecules that um, you know, uh, fulfill the bacterium in the best possible way. And this is how we got interested in the CS1 molecule. Because CS1, um, and there's, other, there's work from other groups who have shown that, and we've confirmed it in, in, in our own work, the CS1 molecule is very highly and almost uniformly expressed on myeloma cells. Um, so every myeloma cell has this CS1 molecule on it. And this is true for patients um, who come uh, for the first time to the doctor and who have a new diagnosis. Um, this is also true for patients you know, who've undergone uh, some treatment. And this is also true for patients who have undergone a lot of treatment, uh, intensive therapy, and have relapsed with their disease multiple times. So this CS1 molecule is, is really, uh, in our view, a good target because it's very uniformly expressed, uh, independent from the, the treatment uh, history of the patient and the, the disease stage of the myeloma. And, and on the other just hand, a, side, we, oh, Let me yeah, ask you a follow-up question. Is that also regardless of genetic feature? It just doesn't matter. All myeloma patients are expressing this protein. As, as far as we can tell, yes. We have analyzed about um, 100 patients here at our institution, and uh, we have seen uh, the CS1 molecule to be expressed in all of these patients. The expression level, so the, the number of molecules that is expressed on myeloma cells, that may vary uh, between patients, but still we would call all of these uh, the patients to be CS1 positive. And that you know, includes patients with um, various um, cytogenetics. So uh, this, we would say that the CS1 expression can be found independent from what the cytogenetic status of, of this myeloma is. And to, to just comment on the other part of the, the, the story, of course, is you know, um, CS1 is not expressed on any essential normal uh, tissue in the body. So we think that when we target the molecule, we will see very little or even no side effects. Right? There, is no, uh, there is no solid organ that is CS1 positive. And that, that is, of mm -hmm. course, of great interest and of great importance for us because if the target was to be expressed on a solid normal tissue, then we would uh, also cause damage to it. And with CS1, we don't think that will be the case. We think that the CS1 will be a very well tolerable uh, and very safe target. And that's what we've understood. So in leukemia, they're targeting the CD19, is that correct? But some, sometimes the CD19 can be on normal cells as well. So is that, what, is that what's happening um, in, the, in the world of leukemia? Absolutely. This is what, what's happening in the world of uh, leukemia and lymphoma. Most of the leukemias and lymphomas derived from B cells, the B cell lineage. And all of these B cells express this molecule that is called CD19. So what is, when you treat now patients with the, the, the CD19 CAR, what happens is that, uh, of course, the leukemia and lymphoma is, is uh, very well recognized, and in a lot of these patients are also eradicated. Um, what also happens is that the normal B cells that are still present in the patient or that are starting to redevelop once the leukemia is, is, um, is gone, that these normal B cells are also being eliminated. So it is an anticipated but still undesired outcome. Um, right. However, um, it, it is quite tolerable to not have these B cells around, right? So it's, um, 
it's 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 unpleasant, but typically, you know, these patients have a very good quality of life, and it is it is tolerable. Um, you know, you can do infusions to to these patients and replace the antibodies that these B cells normally produce. But you're looking for something better for myeloma, which makes us happy, right? <laughs> yeah, but but you know, it, it, uh, it, to be honest with you, the CD19 is a very good target for immunotherapy because it 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 is very it is very hard to find target molecules that are only expressed on the tumor and not anywhere anywhere else, right? Mm. Um, because where would it then come from? So the mm-hmm. CD19 is actually a very good example, and uh, it's an example, you know, how even though the target molecule may be expressed on a small subset of normal cells, it is still tolerable uh, to not have these cells around. So, um, you know, with when we look at different cancer entities, we would be quite happy to take anything similar, anything that is at least as good as CD19. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So, in your proposal, I was reading also about BCMA antigens. Can you explain the addition or the relationship to CS2CS1. Uh huh. So, so the BCMA uh, that's the preparation for B cell maturation antigen, and that is an alternative candidate antigen that uh, we and others are investigating as a car target for myeloma. Um, so we're, we're in a lucky position that in myeloma there's not only CS1 but there's also other candidate antigens, and of course for us. You know, it is a, a research question is, which of these uh, should we select for the first clinical application? And we, we think that also B, BCMA is a strong antigen. Um, however, in, in, in our hands, we think that the CS1 expression on myeloma is typically a little higher and a little more uniform compared to the BCMA. So we would, uh, I think, favor the CS1 antigen over BCMA. However, um, one aspect that we want to address in our research proposal is, is the following. Um, w- one thing that, uh, that can happen with when tumors, so when we treat tumors with immunotherapy, one thing that, that can happen is that the tumor, because the tumor now gets under pressure, um, can try to lose the antigen so that uh, it is not visible anymore to the immune system. That's a phenomenon that we call immune escape. Um, that can occur. We we don't know if that will occur with multiple myeloma, but we think it's always a good idea to be prepared. And in order to be prepared, we're investigating multiple antigens or an antigen that we can then select um, in the event that CS1 expression uh, is getting lost. And then we think BCMA would be a strong target. Also, we think that uh, from our experience in, in our immunotherapy work and in our preclinical models, that it can be a very strong strategy to do what we call combinatorial antigen targeting. So we're not only hitting the tumor with one, uh, targeting one antigen, but we're hitting it with uh, targeting two antigens at the same time. So we think that targeting both CS1 and BCMA in combination could actually be a very strong strategy and don't give the myeloma time to adapt and start losing one antigen because it's under pressure from two sides. And that's one thing that we want to address. And also here, we should probably say that BCMA, um, we would consider it as a potentially very safe antigen. Um, it's from the name, you, you, you may guess it already. It's called B-cell maturation antigen, so it's something that is also on this, on this B-cell lineage. So uh, we would not expect toxicity to any, any normal organs, um, and that would be a good thing. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes, it did. It's- Great explanation. So it sounds okay. as if you are anticipating the, um, what did you call it, immune escape potential. So basically uh-huh. a CD uh, or a CS1 cell might actually be CS1 negative, but still might be a myeloma cell. Is that what you're, that's what you're saying, correct? Yeah. So how frequently um, would might that happen? Have you seen that already in kind of some preliminary data or some pre-lab work that you're doing? That is a, that's an important question, and, and the thing is, we have not seen it in our lab work, um, and probably we would not see it or not know until we've treated patients with it. Um, it's, I think it would be quite hard to predict it in the lab, um, but it's something that we want to be prepared for if it occurs in a clinical setting. 
Um, I think we've learned a little bit from these CD19 CAR clinical trials. Um, so CD19 is a very strong antigen on these leukemias and lymphomas, and it is very, very rare that one of these leukemias is actually CD19 negative. But we've seen also in the clinical trials with CD19 CARs that in a very small fraction of patients, and this is about 5, uh, maybe 10 percent, um, the leukemia learns to adapt and it learns to lose the antigen to hide from the immune system. So here we've learned that this uh, can occur in, in the clinical setting, and that's why we want to be prepared for it. Um, we've not observed it so far in our preclinical work in the lab, and that is very encouraging. Um, but as I said, you know, it's something mm -hmm. that we know can happen, so we need to be prepared. Yeah. Right. Well, that's Maybe, uh, mm -hmm. Herman Einzel, I can, I can add in something. Uh, there is some indirect evidence that CS1 is rarely lost on the surface of myeloma cells because you all know that there is an antibody that is directing the CS1 molecule in the clinic, elotusumab. And this antibody has been given to patients for more than two years, and it still seemed to be able to work, indicating that the target for this antibody, which is CS1, is still present on the myeloma cells after long-term exposure to an antibody that is directed against this antigen. And therefore, we are fairly optimistic that the same will hold true also for CAR T cells that are directing the CS1 molecule. But I think the strategy that we kind of generate a CAR T cell that is addressing two antigens on the myeloma cell surface will allow us also in the rare events of a down regulation or a loss of this antigen on the surface of the myeloma cells to still be able to recognize and to kill the myeloma cell. And has elotuzumab helped you kind of just determine that CS1 would be a good target, or you were already heading in that direction anyway? It just gives yeah, greater validation, this maybe. Direction and, yeah, and therefore we actually chose the target that is also addressed by elotuzumab with our CAR T cell to be, to be really on the safe side, that we can use the efficacy and the safety data that are available from the elotuzumab uh, administration to patients also for our CAR T cell approach. Mm -hmm. And a follow-up question on that. I know that we just had a show where um, Dr. Morgan was saying that on average, the typical myeloma patient has five different types of myeloma clones in, their, in your cells. And it sounds like you're saying that doesn't really matter because they all express all these different clones, no matter what they are, have CS1 present on them. But um, when you think about using one therapy, I know many people in myeloma say you need to attack myeloma with uh, multiple therapies. So is there a possibility that this could potentially just wipe everything out? Could there still be residual that you need to handle in some other combination type approach? Or would you like to speak to that for a minute? Yeah, no, no, happily. I think if we take the example of the CD90 CAR T cells, what we know with the CAR-19 T cell that is specifically targeting B cell malignancies, like especially acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and the CD19 CAR T cell can work in patients that are completely refractory to any other treatment. And it has been shown now in, in not a lot of patients, but in, 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 in a significant number of patients, that these CAR T cells are able to completely wipe out all even resistant tumor cells. And therefore, we are quite confident that the CAR T cell approach targeting an antigen that is so broadly expressed like CS1, that is actually a strategy to, to, to really control uh, for long term multiple myeloma, maybe even to eradicate all myeloma cell clones. I think these different cell clones, they have different genetic background. So uh, um, treatments like chemotherapy, 
like targeted strategies uh, like, for example, proteasome inhibitors or um, uh, imids, probably there will be resistance mechanisms. But I think for this kind of approach that we are ch choosing, the, the CAR T-cell approach, resistance is, is, is very unlikely. And, 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 as, and even if there is, we have this kind of second strategy by using the BCMA car in addition to the to the CSA1 car. So I think this is a, a combined strategy that will really help us to 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 really uh, get around the problem of of resistance and get around the problem of different tumor cell clones that are present in a patient. What was so it kind of uh, helpful? Mm -hmm. No, that's perfect. Yeah. And so this this BCMA is like a, a extra backup strategy to make sure that you have you're hitting it from all sides. It sounds like. I think so. Yeah. One 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 additional comment, and just briefly, and um, you know, when you when you look at current myeloma myeloma therapies, you know, it's, it's very rare that a single drug um, is curing the disease. So we know we acknowledge that, and we can also envision that the CAR T cell therapy may be used in combination with other uh, already established uh, myeloma therapies. And we're addressing this in our proposal in AIM-3. We're saying we want to see how do commonly used myeloma drugs um, interact with the CAR T cells. And we've selected you know, drugs that we think could be synergistic. So we're looking at uh, the imids, uh, linalidomide, pomalidomide, for example. We're looking at the proteasome inhibitors and uh, these, uh, these checkpoint inhibitors, because we think that all of these drugs um, have the potential to work synergistically with our CAR T cells. So it is also quite possible that if we can demonstrate that the CAR T cells are safe, that then in future clinical trials we may use them in combination with existing myeloma drugs um, and then find kind of the dose of each of the components um, to accomplish you know, optimum efficacy um, anti-myeloma function, but also optimum safety and the best uh, safety profile also in terms of side effects uh, so we can accomplish best uh, best possible quality of life for the patients. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about both safety, but before we talk about safety, maybe you can just walk us through an example of how you would use this. You pull the T-cells out of the patient and then you engineer them to target the CS1 and then could you can just kind of walk us through the steps? And then after that, let's talk about how you are mitigating safety. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you, you explained the, the the manufacturing quite well. So we would you know have we would draw blood from from the patient, and we have done this with you know in the lab a couple of times. So we can draw as little as one syringe of peripheral blood uh, from the patient, and that allows us to um, isolate enough uh, uh, enough T cells to do the trick. And then you know, we take the T salts, we start to activate them, and that's happening then you know, in, 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 in the lab. Uh, so we can do the gene transfer. So we insert the gene that encodes our CS1 car, and then um, we, we amplify these T salts until we have uh, sufficient numbers uh, to treat um, uh, the patient. And that you know, we're, we've been thinking very hard about how to best design this, this what we call manufacturing process. So we're using very advanced uh, reagents that uh, we can uh, use to select the cells, but we can also detach these reagents. So these T cells look like they've never been manipulated. Mm. And then we've been thinking about how to best get this, this gene for the, for the car receptor in. And, you know, a lot of groups are using viruses. They're called retroviruses or lentiviruses that infect the cells and then they integrate the gene. Um, we have, we're pursuing a non-viral approach. So it's like we're using a process that's called electroporation. So we're shooting a little, a tiny hole in the wall of the, in the, the cell wall of these T cells. And that is enough to allow them to take up the gene for the car and integrate it. And uh, that's a very gentle method. It's uh, also quite easy with this method to disseminate this procedure to other institutions because you know the, the requirements are uh, for, to do this are, are quite easy easily met and this process should uh, take us not more than two weeks and we're actually working very hard on cutting the time down that we need to manufacture such a cell product some of my phd students in the lab they've they have it down to like five days so we can mm. the patient comes in on a monday we have the cell product ready 
on uh, the Friday. And uh, we're, we want to work in this proposal uh, on optimizing uh, the short manufacturing process so that uh, we can allow uh, patients, you know, and uh, everywhere to get access to these kinds of therapies. And that kind of also brings a link to, to then safety, right? How do we think uh, about safety? Shall we um, go through a couple uh, thoughts about that? Oh, sure. Yeah? I mean, we already covered that you know, these CAR T cells are very powerful. They're very potent. And uh, one thing that we've learned um, through the clinical studies with our colleagues in Seattle and also through our preclinical work is that we don't need a lot of T-cells um, to cure even a large tumor. Um, so one and very important safety issue um, is to recognize that we don't have to give a lot of T-cells. So basically what we're giving is in the order of maybe 100, maybe 200,000 T-cells per kilogram body weight. So if you pellet, if you have these cells in a lab tube and you put them in the centrifuge and pellet them down. I mean, that's a pellet that is much, much smaller than the um, than, uh, than my fingernail, for example, right, if you, if you look at it. So mm -hmm. that's a very, very tiny amount of cells. And that's uh, using a low number of cells is, in, in our view, the first and very important uh, thing we can do uh, to um, make sure that we have a safe treatment. Um, then what we do is... Um, we're looking back at nature and say, okay, how, how does the immune system typ typically fight um, when it goes you know, against influenza virus, for example? And what we see is that you know, there, there are so-called killer cells and there are helper cells, and they're both part of doing the job. So one thing that we do is we give equal proportions of these killer and helper cells so that in, in every patient that we treat, there's an equal amount of both. And that's, that's different from the current protocols in the clinic. Um, well, in the current clinical protocols are like that you draw the blood, you do this uh, cell manufacturing, but you don't control for the proportion of killer cells and helper cells. So that literally in each patient, the cell product is a little different. And that is you know, a variable that is being introduced both for the, for the work against the myeloma, but also for the safety. Right. So mm -hmm. what we do is we use equal proportions of killer cells and helper cells so that we have a uniform cell product for all patients. And that is, then it is much, much easier uh, to make sure that uh, the treatment is safe and that if side effects occur, that we can almost predict um, whether side effects will occur, how strong they will be, and when they occur. Um, and last but not least, um, we have included in our car uh, a safety feature. We call it an EGFR tag. Um, so we've taken a little, a little molecule and uh, we've put this um, into the T-cells as part of our engineering process. This little molecule is called EGFR. It's called the Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor. Um, and we've taken that from, from the you know, naturally occurring molecule, but we've modified this molecule such so that we can use it for all purposes. And the purpose is this receptor sits on the surface of the T cell, and we can target it with an antibody. Um, and this antibody is clinically approved, so we can give it uh, to a patient, and we can use it to deplete the T cells if we are worried about the safety or if we see toxicity. So um, you would call it in scientific terms like a depletion marker or a suicide gene. So we can, if we are worried, um, give this drug, uh, this antibody, uh, to our patient, and it will eliminate the CAR T cell. And that's uh, a very unique feature. Um, there's only one. There's only the clinical trials coming out from the Seattle lab where I've worked before that have this feature. And um, we think that's a very important, a very important component of our safety strategy. So it's like an emergency stop button, basically. Exactly. That's how what it is. And so it would Maybe stop everything, though. I mean, if you were starting to have a major reaction that was life-threatening for the patient, you would you would give them that, and you would just say, "Okay, we have to we have to redo our strategy with how these T cells were taken up by that particular patient." Yeah, I think by just giving this antibody, which is kind of attacking these gene modified T cells, we can eliminate these T cells very rapidly and thereby stop any side effects that are um, occurring in the patient. Of course, we are also losing then the efficacy of, of, of the strategy in this patient. Maybe one, one additional point, 
uh, in the CAR19 T cell, there was a specific side effect that was neurotoxicity. So patient experienced kind of uh, fits or they had speech disturbances. And we have very good data that are indicating that this phenomenon is CD19 specific. And we are not anticipating these kind of side effects in the CAR T cell therapy um, addressing CS1 or BCMA. Mm-hmm. And maybe you can talk about duration. Oh, go ahead. If you want, if you had more information on safety, but um, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we we understand that, of course, safety is is the the, the first and utmost uh, concern also for us. So you know, we're thinking about this uh, a lot, and um, you know, the, a lot of the what is being viewed as a safety issue with these CAR T cells is actually related to how well they work. Um, and it is, you know, when they start to see their antigen and start to see the myeloma, it's a very strong immune reaction that takes place. It's, a, you know, it's very, it's like when you have a very strong uh, flu, for example. And the patient recognized that, and it can be very, uh, you know, unpleasant to experience that. Experience that. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we call it like a cytokine storm, and all these uh, cytokines, and this is what the T cells produce, are being released into the blood. But I think, you know, with more and more patients getting treated with CAR T cells, we're also getting better at um, learning how to deal with it and uh, seeing this cytokine storm come very early. And I think this is what's what's happening in the field right now, that you have, you know, when you when you just do a routine um, blood draw, there are some parameters that can indicate to you, even before the patient is experiencing the side effects, that these side effects may come, and then you can take preventive measures with you know treatments that are readily available in the in the in the clinic, um, but again you know we we have thought hard about how to um, provide patients with, with a safe treatment. Um, the the cell composition we discussed is important. The suicide or depletion marker EGFR is important, um, and of course one thing you know we we want to emphasize again is. Our CS1 CAR is unique in that it uses the same targeting domain as the elotuzumab antibody, called the HULOC-63 targeting domain. And um, elotuzumab has been given to many, many patients, and uh, we think it's a safe drug. So we think that that also our CAR will be safe because it's targeting the identical epitope. And our CAR is the only CAR in the only CS1 CAR in the field that is using this particular targeting domain. so we're we're quite hopeful that the treatment will be very safe. So you're saying not our not all CAR T cells are the same, and not all CAR CS1 T cells are the T cell char- or T cell therapies are the same. Exactly. Um, so yeah, as I said, the the CAR is a synthetic molecule. So you know all these receptors at different research groups are called CAR. But if you look of how mm-hmm. they are designed, there are a lot of differences because you know there's some essential portions that each of these receptors has, because, but because it's a synthetic molecule, um, all of these can vary slightly or even quite significantly in how they are built. And the other thing is that you know, the CS1 molecule on the myeloma cells, that is a very large molecule. And of course, it is folded in a three-dimensional way. And there are uh, different uh, locations of where antibodies direct against, directed against CS1 can target. That is what we call an epitope. And there are several antibodies that uh, people have generated to target CS1. Um, there's the LUC90 antibody that some groups are using. And uh, there is, for example, the HULUC63 antibody. And um, the HULUC63 antibody binds to an epitope, so a specific site on the CS1, CS1 molecule that is kind of it's in a particular location. And the design of the car needs to be in a specific way to, so that the car can bind to that uh, epitope. And we have, uh, you know, when, when I did my training in Seattle, we did a lot of work on, on how to best design these cars, and we found that what we call the spacer domain is very important. And we can make this spacer, and this is what anchors the sensor on the T cell surface, can be long or short. And we found that uh, a particular spacer length is desired to um, bind this epitope, who looks 63, uh, very effectively. And that's the trick that, that we included, and uh, that's why we uh, can use the same targeting domain like elotuzumab. Hmm. So that's a lot of detail about um, oh, trying to create this target. It's amazing what you're doing. 
So can we talk about duration a little bit? I know one of the objectives was to give this single therapy that could perpetuate itself for a long period of time and ultimately maybe avoid the toxicity that chemotherapy brings. But do, would you like to speak to that? Yeah. So you mean how, how long the, these CAR T cells will be effective? Um, mm -hmm. You know, we... we we think that uh, a single infusion of these these CAR T cells uh, may be sufficient, and um, you know it's like a living drug. These these T cells uh, will go into the bloodstream, and they will look for and uh, probably find the myeloma cells. And as soon as they see the myeloma cells, they will uh, get activated, and they say, "Look, there's here's our target," and then they start uh, to divide and to amplify. Um, hopefully until uh, all or most of the myeloma cells are being cleared. Um, then what, what typically happens is that you know, when, the, when the target cells are gone, then um, the number of these CAR T cells will uh, start to decrease again. Um, and hopefully what will happen is that the, the T cells start to form memory, memory cells that can persist in the bloodstream and in the bone marrow for potentially many years, maybe decades. And... Um, in the event that somewhere in the body um, myeloma cells come back, then the T cells are ready um, to attack again. So they can, uh, from this memory state, go back into activation mode and destroy the myeloma cells. And that's why we're so excited because, you know, this is a one-time application of a, of a drug, of a living cell product, and it can potentially be active for, for many, many years. Um, of course, you know, th this is what works very well in the lab and in the preclinical models. And um, the, the best evidence or experience we have is from the CD19 CAR trials. And here, some of the patients are out uh, three years now from their treatment. Hmm. And indeed, in some of these patients, we can still detect uh, the CAR T cells that were infused three years ago. Wow. Um, so that is very encouraging and kind of uh, makes us hopeful that this, what we think will happen, is indeed happening. Um, of course, we can only tell that definitively if we've treated patients with it and then have, have done the follow-up. But we think, um, you know, that um, th this, this treatment can, with a one-time administration, be um, a very effective treatment and be effective for many, many years for the patients. Well, it sounds Maybe wonderful. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe maybe just an illustration. When we first used this redirection of T cell strategy, we used it uh, in patients for, with ALL. And one of our first patients was a patient who was 35 years old. She had two young children, had undergone an allogeneic stem cell transplantation, and had a full blown relapse 60 days after the allo. Oh, and everybody man. was really afraid this was the end of the story. And then mm. we gave her one application of this redirection of T cells, and she came into molecular emission of her ALL without any chemotherapy and remained in this molecular remission now for more than three years. So just to illustrate the capacity and the opportunity this kind of redirection of T cell strategy has in the clinic. Well, that's truly stunning. I would like to open I'll it up it. to some other. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Maybe one last comment is, you know, we're we're hopeful that with immunotherapy we may enter a new era in myeloma treatment where the treatment is essentially chemotherapy free because we really we realize. You know that um, a lot of patients are kind of worried or afraid of the chemotherapy, and rightfully so, with a lot of the, the side effects that occur. So, you know, with the immunotherapy, like like CAR T cells, um, either alone, maybe in combination with other drugs or, or antibodies, but more like conventional drugs that can modulate the immune system, like the IMETs or like the checkpoint inhibitors, we may indeed come into a new era of treatment that is essentially chemotherapy free. And with that, uh, free from the, the typical side effects of chemotherapy. And that's where we're working very hard uh, every day in the lab and also here in the clinic to uh, make that happen and transform uh, therapy into that direction. And I'm happy to take now, we're happy to take any questions that you guys still have. Um, so oh, please go well, ahead. I have some more Jenny, questions. Jenny, can you hear me? Yeah, Pat, go ahead. I know you have to go. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I've been having trouble. I, either the mute's on or the mute's off. I don't know if you've ever, if I've ever, my pleas have ever even made it through. So good. I'm glad you nope. can. I, I just have two short questions, and then I'm late for a uh, Kyprolis infusion my sec my second day. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, to review, you can you can do this infusion, and it's it's not necessarily tied to either an auto or allo stem cell transplant. It's it's independent, correct? It's completely independent, yes. So you that don't is, need, like, like in auto or allo transplantation, you need an intensive chemotherapy before you do the transplant. This is not necessary for doing the CAR T-cell treatment. You do this without chemotherapy. That's wonderful. That's great. And the second question I had was, have you looked at this at all in amyloidosis? Amyloidosis. No, we ha we haven't. I think the first step will be in to go into myeloma. If it works into in myeloma patients, it could well work also in amyloidosis patients. But I think the first step will be the patients with myeloma, and if successful, amyloidosis might also be a target. The 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 issue in in, in amyloidosis is, as you probably also know very well is that in, in patients with amyloidosis, often these patients have ha uh, cardiac or renal problems, and this could interfere with CAR T-cell therapy. So, uh, therefore, we would like to start in myeloma and then see whether we have any problems, and if not, then it, it might actually be transferred also to amyloidosis patients. So I hear from a lot of, of patients that are both myeloma and amyloidosis, I call it Amy. That's why I mispronounced it in the first place. Okay. Uh, and, and so does that mean, at least initially, they would probably be excluded from a trial, right, because you wouldn't want to confuse yeah. the mix in the, and the In the mass. first trial, yeah, yeah, completely. Mm -hmm. yeah, I completely that makes sense. agree in the first trial. We probably wouldn't include them, yeah. Great. And then my final question, which is a personal, which is a personal plea, is as, as I've, re I've now relapsed four times, and as this thing's progressed over eight years, I've become a non-secretor. Uh, any chance that non-secretors would be eligible for, for clinical trial work? Absolutely, because what, what happens in non-secretors is that the biology of the myeloma cells is changing so that these cells are stopping to secrete paraproteins or light chains but they don't change the surface molecules. So in spite of the myeloma cells becoming non-secretory cells, they are still targets for the, for the CS1 uh, uh, CAR T cell. So, so um, being non-secretory is, is definitely still a, a target or a, 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 a patient that is eligible for a CAR T cell Therapy directing the CD, uh, directing the CS1 molecule. Oh, hey, doctor, that's wonderful, Jenny. Sounds like we got a winner here. <laughs> Sorry, I've got to run. Really appreciate all you do. Okay, thank you so much, thank you. Jack. Absolutely. Jack, I know you have some questions. I do. Just to finish up on Pat's question, though, I think his question, being an non-secretor, would that still be uh, part, or could he still be included in a clinical trial? Because usually it's a, yes, a measurement issue of a clinical trial. Ah, you mean yeah, but but the the same apply. Yeah, I I, I now I I can understand what you are aiming for. The, the problem to assess the the response in a non secreting uh, myeloma patient, but you still you still can do bone marrow punctures. You can still do uh, assessment of circulating myeloma cells. So there are, there are uh, uh, tools to measure the efficacy also in patients that are non-secretory. So we, we, we would definitely like to include non-secretory patients in, in our first clinical trials. I'm sure that would be great. Um, I'm, uh, I'm interested in the CD19 approach that Dr. June and UPenn have taken. So I heard him say that what in January when they've tried a few uh, myeloma patients, tried this on a few myeloma patients, that they've shown some response and that they're going to announce something regarding that at ASCO. And yet, as you noted and he noted, 
um, CD19 is not expressed very much in myeloma. So I'm wondering why why has it worked a little bit, maybe? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that's an interesting question that we're also uh, trying to understand. And I think also so is Dr. June, um, who's a very is an excellent colleague of, of ours and uh, absolutely also a leader in the field. Um, now we we have we're also looking at CD19 expression on on, on in our myeloma patients, and we we, we do not see it uh, very often. Of course, one one hypothesis is, and I really have to say that it is a, an, a, an hypothesis, is that there are some what we call cancer stem cells or myeloma stem cells that are at the very beginning of of the disease, and they they may express maybe low levels of the CD19, and that's why you, you might see a clinical effect when you target these stem cells. However, I think we should also note that you know, the, the number of patients that he's treated uh, is, is very, very small. Um, right. Of course, he's presented some of the data in, you know, in oral communications at meetings, but not in a manuscript where really all the details and a longer follow-up is being presented. And one thing we also need to, to, to consider is that you know, typically before you administer the CAR T cells, you, you give, and I think I understand that's also the case in this particular clinical trial, there is also um, some kind of, we call it a conditioning regimen. So it's also a form of, of chemotherapy that is being administered. So you would need to delineate very carefully if in this particular trial the efficacy you see against myeloma is really due to the CAR T cells. Is it a durable remission and a long-lasting response? And or, you know, was some of the effect maybe also driven by the conditioning regimen, which contains some chemotherapy, right? Um, okay. We would still think we would still think that for you know for in order to address really all myeloma patients and um, you know targeting a molecule like CS1 or BCMA would um, be preferable in our view just because it makes more sense because we can see the antigen we know where it is and we know that it's on the myeloma and you know we typically like to target something that we can see that we can measure um, rather than CD19 which is very hard to tell where it is, and if it's maybe on some subset of myeloma cells. Okay, makes sense yeah. to me. I have a question okay. with respect to, since you mentioned elotuzumab, um, the monoclonal antibody that targets the same CS1, it didn't mm -hmm. have any single agent activity. Yeah. Would it ever be used in conjunction with the CS1 CAR T cell, or would they actually conflict with one another? Is there any reason to think the CS1 CAR T cell shouldn't have any single ac agent activity. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about that? Absolutely. Yeah. Now we were well aware of the activity of, of elotuzumab and that as a single agent it is not doing much. Um, but that's why um, we think the um, the CAR strategy is so appealing because now what we do is kind of we put to the elotuzumab a whole other set of, effect, of functions, right, because we couple a T-cell to it. So not only uh, can it um, amplify in the body, but it also is much, much more potent because the T-cells, they are designed to kill and eliminate, right? And that's why, you know, the, our CAR T-cells in, in the lab are so strong. So we clearly think that the, the CS1 CAR T-cells will be much, much stronger compared to the elotuzumab um, in, in treating myeloma. And you know, we, the very good, we have very good evidence from our preclinical models. These are mouse models. Um, these are mice who have myeloma. And we've treated, we kind of compared treatment with elotuzumab and uh, with our CS1 CAR. And consistent with what we see in the clinic, the elotuzumab in the mouse model is not doing much. Um, but the CAR T cells, they have completely eradicated the myeloma in the mouse model. So we have mice that are now completely myeloma-free and that are long-term survivors of this disease. And this is an activity that we've not seen with any other myeloma drug. If we use conventional drugs like melphalan, for example, that's a common, um, common chemotherapy that you give. Um, if we treat these mice with melphalan and we dose it high enough to eradicate the myeloma, then these mice are really in trouble from the side effects. But with the CS1 CAR, that um, you know, we don't see the side effects, and we can completely control the myeloma. So that's you know, is making us hopeful that also in the clinic, the CS1 CAR will be much much more powerful. 
Now, asking about combinations, um, it you know, it is thinkable that you would give the CS1 CAR T cells first, and then after a while, if you think it's helpful, you can still add the elotuzumab as a backup and to reconsolidate a remission. Um, that is thinkable, but that's clearly also something for the future. Thank you. I am uh, really excited by by all of this, uh, and I love the, not that I understand it, but the equal proportions of the killer and the helpers, helper cells and the EFGR approach to minimize side effects. So I, uh, I'm, this is very exciting. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you for listening. So we had a couple more questions from Gary, and they are write-in questions. He said, um, you're using the... Uh, who Luke the 63 versus the Luke 90 monoclonal antibody to build a better CS1 CAR T cells. Are there others that you might want to consider, or is this the best one that you found to date? Mm. Yeah, but that's a, that's a great question. I think I, I commented on, on some of our reasoning um, why choosing one over the other, and, and then I agree that is very a lot of technical detail. Um, I think there are other antibodies, um, but to us, the HULOC-63 is very appealing, uh, just as I said, because it's um, the same targeting domain that elotuzumab uses, and we have mm -hmm. the safety data with elotuzumab, so what could be better than having that on board? Um, essentially, you know, there, there's a couple of CAR receptors that are now entering clinical evaluation. This is the CD19. There are some CARs also in solid tumors, and we never had the situation that... Uh, the antibody using the exact same targeting domain had been used in the clinic and had provided evidence for the safety. So for us, this is a really win-win situation because um, the elotuzumab has been used. Um, there's, um, it, it's a very safe drug, and now we're using the car using the same targeting domain. Um, so we're also thinking that our CAR T cells will be safe. So it's, for us, that's a very strong rationale to stick with the HULOC-63. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it might take you further than something else that you've already been able to prove yeah. things. So um, he also asked, do you envision CAR T cells to possibly be used as upfront myeloma therapy? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, in the way that clinical development of novel drugs uh, works, is you kind of have to work your way up to the front. So backwards. <laughs> typically, you, yeah, you have to way, work your way backwards. Um, so typically, you start, um, you know, in in patients who had established standard treatments, and where these treatments have failed, and then then the experimental treatments uh, enter enter the the stage. And this is also what you know what 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 has to be done here. Uh, of course, we will then see how how effective the treatment is, and if it is effective, what we hope. Uh, we, of course, then start to work our way backwards um, all the way to the front. Um, if we'll ever use it as a frontline therapy, we, we don't know, and we're probably a lot of uh, work uh, is ahead of us to, to determine that. Um, mm -hmm. We also think that, you know, when patients come to see you, we, you would also we would probably need, will do some kind of stratification. It's not like all patients will be treated in the same way. Um, for some patients, you know, um, an upfront treatment with established chemotherapy or established regimens may be entirely appropriate, whereas for other patients where there are markers that let us think, okay, the myeloma is, is high risk, um, there's a higher risk of relapse and rapid disease progression, um, maybe in, the, in such an entity, even an, an upfront treatment with CAR T cells may be appropriate. But again, that is subject to a, a lot of clinical work that is ahead of us that we're mm -hmm. happy to undertake and we, we hope for your support in, in starting this work because we you know we, we have to start walking and have to start running, um, get this car uh, ready for the clinic, get it into the clinic, see um, is it safe, is it as effective as we hope, and then start working our, ba our way backwards, just as you said. Mm -hmm. And can you give us an idea of the timeline that you see ahead of you and, all the, and the milestones for those and then an anticipated budget? Yeah. Um, so the, the 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 timeline to enter a clinical trial, uh, we're you know we're working very hard on this, and we have uh, a very, very strong preclinical program, and we would hope that within the next two or three years, uh, we are in the clinic with this. Um, it's not a it's not a trivial thing. It's it's uh, you know the the manufacturing process is technically challenging, 
Um, we also have to get our approval from the regulators, and uh, this is kind of the equivalent to the FDA, mm -hmm. before we can uh, treat actual patients. And the typical experience is that this takes uh, several years. We have uh, started uh, this, uh, doing this also for CD19 cars, for example, here in Germany, um, and we're clear pioneers in Europe with this. Um, and we're quite hopeful that in two or three years we can also do this with the CS1. For the, the project that we're proposing, is um, this is, of course, um, some pre-refinement of the strategy in the preclinical lab. Uh, that includes the evaluation of CS1 and or BCMA. Um, and the question whether using it in combination can make the treatment more effective and prevent these antigen escape and um, immune escape variants. We want to confirm that what we think is that the, the CD4 helper T cells are beneficial to have in the product. And we want to look for the, the synergy <laughs> established by Loma drugs. These are three preclinical aims. And of course, one aim is to scale up the manufacturing of uh, these CAR T cells such that we can do it in uh, the, the clean room lab and then manufacture uh, salt products uh, for a clinical trial. That's the fourth aim to do this, what we call upscaling. So we get kind of, we transform the process from the re preclinical research lab to the clean room lab. And in the clean room lab, this is where a clinical grade cell products can, can be manufactured. So we think mm -hmm. all this is feasible uh, two, in a two to three year period. Um, and you also asked for, for a rough estimate of a, of a budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a ballpark. So, you know, we, we um, we would think that a budget of 200 to 240,000 dollars would be uh, very appropriate to address these aims. And uh, typically, what is done uh, we, with these kinds of proposals here in Germany is that also the host institution is making a contribution. So, if um, uh, my Loma crowd um, research initiative would uh, select our proposal for funding, then also the, the the university here in Würzburg would make a contribution that. Um, uh, will contribute to the successful conduct of the project. And that would be in terms of staff, so it would be maybe a research technician in the lab and some funding for consumables and reagents to make sure that um, you know, all the timelines and milestones are being met and also to be appreciative of the support that we would receive from a philanthropic institution like you. Hmm. Well, that would be fabulous. We would love that. Is it faster in Germany to get a drugs approved than, than it is in the States with the FDA? Unfortunately, not. <laughs> I must say, <laughs> most of the novel agents are approved in the States before they are approved in Europe. So, for example, carfilzomib is already available in the States for quite some time and is not officially approved in Europe. But we, we at least in Germany, we have access to carfilzomib. And also mm -hmm. pomalidomid was approved, I think, one year before it was in the, in the U.S. when compared to, to Europe. So I think the uh, the American myeloma patients uh, uh, can be congratulated that they have uh, more uh, that they, they have access to more of the novel agents than probably the European patients have. Well, outside of a clinical trial, right? Yeah, but also what, what we see. Uh -huh. What we oh, also see as part of our mission is, you know, we're we have a very uh, dense network of national and also international collaborators in the immunotherapy and also CAR and myeloma field. So we also clearly see this as a team effort in a sense that, you know, we were very willing and very happy and actually will be actively pursuing dissemination of this, of the insights that we derive. So clearly the, you know, the insights into how to treat a myeloma with a CS1 CAR, um, you know, would be disseminated to our European colleagues in, in France and Spain, in the Czech Republic, for example, but also to our colleagues in the United States, including Fred Hutch. This is, you know, where I was trained and I still have mm -hmm. very close ties to my friends at Fred Hutch. Um, and they're very busy with running their CD19 CAR trial, and they clearly indicated if we come up with a CAR solution for multiple myeloma, they would be very, very happy to adopt uh, such a protocol and make sure that the protocol will also be opened in, in Seattle, for example. And if in the end Seattle would be first in opening a clinical trial because the U.S. is always a little faster than Germany, then okay, let it be. If it's, if it's for the good of patients, then we're quite happy with that. Well, I think uh, everyone would be delighted to see 
your results and would want to follow suit with those. Um, one last question. Do you, in, in your opinion, to me, this sounds potentially curative. And um, what would you agree with that statement? Or what's your opinion about this new therapy? Because it sounds extremely exciting to me. Well, I think both Rosa Einel and I will have a, a kind of a concluding comment on that. I mean, we're, you know, I think it's uh, it's been the the ambition and the, the dream of many investigators in the field for for many decades to find a curative treatment for multiple myeloma. If we have such a treatment, in the end, can can only be determined in, in clinical trials and very careful clinical evaluation. However, I think you know we're. Um, we see the efficacy of this treatment in the preclinical models, and we see that it has a lot of potential, very strong efficacy. And um, we have cured mice with myeloma, so the next uh, milestone and ambition is cure patients with myeloma. So if we can accomplish that with one CAR T cells, um, that would be wonderful. If it's a CAR T cells alone, or if we have to maybe play another trick, uh, adding in maybe one other component, um, we will see. We're quite hopeful, though, and hope that we're close to that the day. Mm. Well, we are just yeah. so immensely grateful. Dr. Einsler, did you have a comment? Yeah, no, I I just wanted to, to comment on the one patient I already mentioned before. I think if if, if you have seen the, the power of this redirecting T-cell strategy in patients with ALL, where in, in different centers in the U.S. or also European centers now, we have seen patients that are relapsing even after an allogeneic stem cell transplantation and after treatment with this strategy without any chemotherapy achieve molecular emissions and remain in molecular emissions now for years clearly indicates that this is an extremely exciting approach. And uh, I think our strategy is trying to apply and to adopt this approach to myeloma and therefore we are extremely, extremely uh, optimistic about this and uh, also very uh, grateful that you gave us the opportunity today to present our ideas and to discuss our ideas with patients and colleagues. Well, this is amazing to learn about what you're doing, and we think it's just incredible. So thank you for spending your lives and your work doing this for us as patients. We are really, really grateful. Thank you very much indeed. So thank you for participating on this show, and um, we look forward to learning more about your work in the future and hope we can support you. Great. Thanks very much indeed again, and uh, hello to everybody. <laughs> it was an absolute pleasure to, to, to be on the show. It's, it's, a, it's a first for us. We've never been on a show like this. I think mm -hmm. we would do it again. It was it was actually a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is fun. You have to dumb it down for us a little bit, but um, it's. I think it's very helpful for for patients to uh, learn about what's being done in myeloma, so they can start getting involved. I think sometimes we sit back too much, and um, I think you, that researchers are trying to work hard and do great things, and we need to support that work. Wonderful, excellent. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for listening to My Loma Crowd Radio and the new MCRI series. They should help support the discovery of a cure, and we encourage you to become involved. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. VGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.